Hello everyone and welcome to APS webinars. The title of today's webinar is An Introduction to Science Policy and Federal Fellowships. I'm Midha Farooq and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. APS membership gives you easy access to valuable career information and resources such as this webinar. It allows you to get your research out to the community and network with potential employers or colleagues at meetings. It can help you have a greater positive impact on issues that are important to you through grassroots advocacy and find a community of like-minded folks through participation in our forums, divisions, and topical groups. If you're not yet an APS member, we do encourage you to join today you can go to APS.org membership for more information on how to join. Today's presentation features Gail Cohen, Rebecca Wadness, and Jessica Soule, who I will be introducing shortly. After they finish the presentation, the rest of the program will belong to you for our question and answer session. Because of the number of people attending this webinar, we are only accepting text questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. You may submit questions through the question panel at any time during the webinar, and we will answer the questions after the talk. You can also open and close your panel with that little orange arrow on the upper left side of the panel. Additionally, you can adjust computer or phone audio settings with this panel as well. Lastly, we encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that APS webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services. And so with that, let's get started. Our first speaker today is Gail Cohen, who directs the National Academy's Christine Merzaya Science and Technology Policy Graduate Fellowship Program. She also directs the National Academy's Board on Science, Technology, and Economic Policy. She joined the National Academies in 2014 after serving 22 years in the federal government. She spent half of her career uh, government service in the executive branch and half in the legislative branch. She served as the chief economic, uh, economist and deputy democratic staff director of the Joint Economic Committee. Dr. Cohen received a bachelor's from Carnegie Mellon University, an MA from the University of Rochester, and an MS and PhD from Northwestern University. Our next speaker, Becca Wadness leads recruitment and placement for the Presidential Management Fellows Program. In her role, she connects with potential applicants with advanced degrees across all academic disciplines to spread awareness about the program and works closely with federal agencies to encourage participation. Becca herself is a class of 2018 Presidential Management Fellow with a background in international education and human rights across the Middle East and North Africa. Becca holds a BA in political science from the University of Michigan and an MA in Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University. Our last speaker today will be Jessica Soule, the Recruitment Marketing and Alumni Engagement Director for the Science and Technology Policy Fellowships. She serves as National Outreach Liaison, responsible for disseminating information and raising awareness of both the SDPF program and its fellows. She conceptualizes plans and executes annual and multi-year integrating marketing plans and represents STPF at a variety of events and venues, including conferences, universities, and national labs. Prior to arriving at AAAS, she oversaw membership, events, and programming for seven years at the National Council for Science and Environment. Before that, she managed programming in a variety of environmental and scientific nonprofit organizations. Jessica holds an MA in Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning from Tufts University and a Bachelor's in Biology from Boston College. She enjoys running, reading, and camping adventures. Okay, I am now going to hand it over to our first speaker, Dr. Cohen. Please. Thank you very much. making sure. Can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay. So um, I'm here to talk about the Christine Merzine Science and Technology Policy Graduate Fellowship Program. Um, this is a program that's been in existence um, since 1997. It's um, 
a multi-part um, program. It's only 12 weeks and I'm so pleased um, to be here and, and going first because I think of the Merzine program as a feeder program into AAAS um, and to the PMF program. Um, our fellow, you know, since the beginning, we've had over 800 fellows um, go through the program. Uh, it's a 12-week program. The stipend, um, I have the last year's stipend. It'll go up by another $250, I believe, to $9,500. Um, but it's uh, basically um, partnering with um, a mentor at the National Academies, learning about the National Academies, but a, a huge component of the program will be to, to connect with the science policy community in Washington um, and to also network with each other. The, I just wanted to quick, quickly go through the eligibility and the application process. Um, eligibility, you can be a grad, you could be a current graduate student and um, it's not just for students in PhD programs. We've had law school students and, and medical school students as well. Um, we occasionally have um, postdoctoral students. Um, most of our uh, fellows, at, last, at least in the last two years, have been in PhD programs. Last year, I had one medical student. Um, they've either been in PhD programs or very recently completed their PhD. Um, unlike some other programs, we allow um, more than just U.S. citizens or permanent residents. Um, foreign students are also eligible to apply for the program, and we encourage that. Um, we like to have a couple of foreign students every year. I think that the discussion is uh, much richer if we have more than just a U.S. perspective. And um, two years ago, I also had a DACA candidate, uh, a DACA fellow. Um, the application is fairly simple and straightforward. It asks for um, your CV and information, the, the degrees and the experience that you've had. There's a short essay um, and basically and, you know, asking the question of why you were in, why you would be interested in becoming a Merzine Fellow. You'll need two references and you should be looking for people who both know your research and your interest in science policy. Importantly, what people always ask me is, do you need demonstrated mastery of science policy? Definitely not. This you have a you need to have a demonstrated interest in science and technology policy, but not demonstrated mastery. Um, the this year, uh, because COVID nineteen, we're changing the time period of what when, when we're having the twenty twenty one fellowships. It's usually from January to April. This year, because of COVID nineteen and the desire to have the fellowship in person. Fingers crossed uh, that it will be allowed to be in person. We're going to be running it um, from August, the end of August um, through November. So the the uh, have a more detailed de deadline, but basically the deadline to apply will be April 30th, 2021. In the month of May, the mentors are making their preliminary selections. There's some screening going on. In June, the, there'll be a two rounds of interviews both with myself and then with a potential mentor and then um, the final applic the final notification should be in mid-july um, like i said this is we're off a little bit um, this is not our usual time frame so we opened the application on june 15th because our usual time frame but we're gonna we're keeping it open until april 30th um, the session will start on August 30th and it'll end on um, November um, 19th. And finally, there's a lot of information on our website. There's two websites, the National Academies has one, um, but then there's also this um, resignfellow.nas.edu, which I encourage you to go to. You can get there from the National Academies um, portal as well. Um, send me an email or um, I, I wish I could say I was answering my phone um, in the office, but I am not. But um, feel free if you have any questions um, to send me an email. Uh, and at this, I'd like to hand it over to Rebecca. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Gail. Let me just pull up my slides here for you all. So hi everyone, my name is Becca Wadness. Um, I manage the recruitment and placement of presidential management fellows. And um, just gonna chat a little bit about 
what the program is and how you apply, just in case you're not familiar with us. So the PMF program, as we call it, is the federal government's flagship leadership development program for advanced degree holders across all academic disciplines. And so our goal is really to recruit and develop tomorrow's leaders in federal government. Um, our program has been around for over 40 years. It's gone through um, different iterations of what it actually looks like. Um, and, you know, previously it was started as a public policy, public administration program, but in the 80s, oh, okay, it sounds like you can hear me now. Um, in the 80s, it was opened up to all academic disciplines, and we work with over 100 different agencies currently. And we have a high demand um, for students with STEM backgrounds. And so the program involves a very competitive and rigorous application process, which I'll get into a little bit on some of the um, future slides. But what happens is you apply to our program. It's all done online. It's been all online since 2017. So we're lucky about that. Um, and we select a number of finalists who then have access for 12 months to our internal portal where our um, our agency partners across federal government post PMF positions that finalists then will apply to. And so this is um, a, a really awesome way for finalists to be empowered in the process. We don't place you. It's up to you to apply to any position that sounds interesting. Um, and we have new positions coming out every day. So you'll Throughout the year, you'll kind of see different opportunities and you'll interview for the ones that you're interested in. Once you get an offer, that's when you'll start your two year fellowship, which includes a variety of training and development opportunities. It is a full salary and benefits program. You are a federal employee. Um, immediately at the beginning of your fellowship. And the goal is to convert you at the end of the two years into a permanent position. So all of the PMFs start at um, the GS 9, 11, or 12, which is the government's pay scale. And they're really great promotion potentials um, throughout the program. So you could end up as a GS 13 by the end of it. And so it, the fellowship also includes um, you know, rigorous leadership development and training. You have to complete 160 hours of formal interactive training and your supervisor and your agency helps to cover the costs of these opportunities. So really great professional development. You also um, will have to um, take on a four to six month developmental assignment. So this is an opportunity to gain additional exposure throughout the federal government. And so sometimes it'll be just in a different office within the agency you're already working in, or it could be a completely new agency itself um, to gain new skills and contacts and bring those back to your home agency. You'll also be assigned a senior level mentor who will help guide your you know, leadership and development over the two years. And then there's other you know, benefits that all federal employees receive, and they're very agency dependent, but one of the big ones um, is potentially student loan repayment, um, but other things like public transportation subsidies, telework, of course, um, those, are, those are all part of kind of package. And then um, at the end, as I mentioned, it's the opportunity to non-competitively convert to a term or permanent position. Um, so this is a really unique foot into the doorway of federal government without having to apply on USA jobs. Um, so just a snapshot of what we work with in terms of, you know, the number of applicants annually, we receive anywhere between, you know, four to 6,000 a year, um, and then select a number of finalists. This past year, we've had 402 finalists for the class of 2020. Um, these finalists represent 61 academic disciplines. They come from 135 academic institutions and 13% have been veterans over the past four years. And as I mentioned, we work with several agencies to place fellows all throughout the federal government. 
Um, this is a very well-known program once you're in the government, um, and it's seen as a really unique way um, to not only get in, but to, to move up and to have some really valued opinions and unique opportunities. And then the other piece is, while the majority of our opportunities are located in the DC area, we do have fellows in 27 states, and we are continuing to work with our agency partners to create more opportunities throughout the country, because we know that not everyone necessarily wants to move to DC. Uh-oh. Um. Sorry about that. It's saying another window is on top of my screen sharing. So let's see what's going on. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so for eligibility, we're a little bit different than some of the other programs because we accept applications from um, graduate students who are finishing up in their last year of their studies. So the key thing for PMF is that you have to have an advanced degree, but that could be a master's, JD, or a PhD. And for the 2021 application cycle, it opens this September, September 30th, 2020. It remains open for a two week period. And so to be eligible, you either have to be a, a, a current grad student who's finishing up and will have their degree by August 31st of 2021, or a recent grad um, with an advanced degree that was received between September 30th, 2018 and September 30th, 2020. The other thing to keep in mind is that we don't offer any waivers or deferrals. So if you do get in, but then select a different opportunity, you'd have to apply again. And then the other key thing to note is that you either have to have US citizenship or be able to legally work in the US for those two years without sponsorship. Um, many of the agencies are unable to sponsor or take on non-U.S. citizens, so just keep that in mind. So as I mentioned, our application opens for a two-week period every year. Um, once it's live, you'll see the announcement on usajobs.gov, but you don't need a USA Jobs account to apply. That will take you to our PMF talent management system where, where you'll create your own application account. And so to apply, what you need to do is you need to be able to submit a resume of any sort. It can be academic or federal or, you know, a one pager. Your transcript or an alternative. So for the transcript, it can be unofficial. That's OK. You just have to make sure it has the criteria that we ask for. And that is your, um, your academic institution, the degree type you are earning or have received, as well as um, your anticipated graduation date or, your, or the date you graduated. So just make sure you double check that because that's where we receive, where we have to eliminate many candidates just because um, they didn't double check their docs. So please make sure you do that. And then any supporting documentation, um, most common is like veterans preference or reasonable accommodations. And then the online assessment, which I'll get into in a second. Once the application closes after the two weeks, we typically announce finalists um, six weeks later. And that's when you'll find out if you meet it as a finalist, you'll then have 12 months of appointment eligibility to apply to any PMF position that sounds interesting. Um, and then we try to help connect the agencies with finalists through different hiring events, whether that's in person or virtual this year. And then once you secure a position, that's when you will start your two-year fellowship. So for the online assessment, it is um, four parts, all timed. However, you don't have to complete it all in one sitting. But as soon as you start one part, you must complete it in the time allotted. So part A, B, and C, situational judgment, life experience, and problem solving are all um, multiple choice questions with different prompts. And then part D is a short writing prompt. And so the online assessment has been designed to identify evidence of um, specific competencies that OPM has defined as critical to success on the job for PMFs across the federal government. 
So those are flexibility, integrity, interpersonal skills, public service motivation, problem solving, and written communication. And what we have gone ahead and done is we publish annually an assessment guide that kind of walks you through each section of the assessment. Um, we'll provide some sample questions so you have a sense of what it looks like, but it's not really the type of test that you can study for. And so the key thing is just um, to manage your time wisely when it comes to making sure you, you give yourself enough time to complete it within the two weeks, not rushing through it, um, trying to not overthink the questions, um, try to answer honestly. Um, and so, yeah, it, it can, it's a big piece of it. And so I'll, I'll share here on the next slide. So for the selection criteria, um, we judge all of our applicants on the same criteria. And those are your ability to meet our eligibility requirements. So that means your documents have everything we've asked for and you've received your advanced degree in the right time frame. Your online assessment score. And then it's also based on the total number of finalists that our office is allowed to authorize each year. So for example, if 400 finalists are authorized, then the 400 top scoring applicants who meet eligibility requirements will be selected as finalists. So it has nothing to do with your GPA, nothing to do with what university you went to, um, or any of those kind of um, common misconceptions. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight for you, I didn't have a chance to update it, but finalists who come through the PMF program and are placed as fellows work in such a variety of backgrounds and occupations. And so I just wanted to highlight some of um, the biggest agencies that we actually place people with STEM backgrounds. So that's Department of Agriculture, Department of Health and Human Services. And under that, I can tell you the CDC, the NIH, those are really big advocates and um, partners of the PMF program. Um, the EPA, Interior, um, what else do we have here? Department of Veterans Affairs, Energy, Treasury, Transportation, NASA, um, USAID, like you name it, we probably place fellows there. Um, so if you are really interested in a certain agency, um, we can definitely connect you with PMF fellows who are either currently doing their fellowship or alumni, um, and I'm sure they'd be happy to chat more about the program with you. We also always encourage, you know, applicants and finalists to network, like go on LinkedIn, feel free to just engage with a current PMF because that's a huge part of our program is the network. We've been around for over 40 years. We have a network of over 10,000 alum. Um, and so that's one of the greatest benefits of the program and people are really eager to help the next generation. So keeping that in mind. And then finally, if you wanna learn more, I, I really just recommend um, going on to our website. From there, you can subscribe to our listserv. You can see the the number of information sessions that we're holding in September in advance of the application opening. Um, it'll be similar to this, but we're also inviting guest speakers to come talk about the, the their different you know, career trajectories as PMFs. And we actually have a whole session dedicated to STEM overall. And then of course, if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to us at PMF application at opm.gov. And I will be here for um, the wrap up and happy to answer any questions that you might have then. But for now, I'm gonna pass it over to Jessica. Thanks, Becca. And Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, thank you to the American Physical Society for hosting this session as part of your webinar series this summer. And I really enjoyed learning about the Marzion Fellowship and PMF. I certainly learned a few new things about both those programs. And I know that sometimes the application and review process can feel like a mystery for these fellowships. And so I'm really glad that we have this opportunity to share about the AAAS s and Policy Fellowships program today. And then that you can hear from fellows next week as well. 
Uh, as Midhat mentioned, I'm Jessica Soule. I'm lead recruitment for the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships, or STPF. And while we're here discussing STPF, I don't think that's possible without also discussing AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Some people know of us as the publisher of the journal Science. And our mission at AAAS is to advance science, engineering, and innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all people. And AAAS focuses on areas such as advocacy for evidence, science, science diplomacy, careers in STEM. So it's really easy to see why a policy fellowship has its home with AAAS. For those of you who might be new to STPF, the fellowship provides opportunities to doctoral level scientists and engineers to learn firsthand about policymaking while contributing their knowledge and analytical skills to the federal policymaking process. Fellows serve year-long assignments in the federal government in Washington, D.C. And each year, the program adds to a growing core of more than 3,400 alumni who are now working across academia, government, and nonprofits, and industry, continuing to serve the nation and the world. So why do we operate a science policy fellowship? I think that Gail and uh, Becca have already made clear that there is a need for scientists and engineers in the federal government and in policy, um, and AAAS agrees. We think that scientific and technological information is critical to developing good policy, and it's mutually beneficial. Host agencies and offices who host fellows gain access to talented scientists and engineers across a range of career stages and backgrounds. Fellows come from all different STEM disciplines and all different career stages. And fellows then gain firsthand experience in how the federal policy system operates and sometimes doesn't. And they gain an understanding of how science can support decision making and implementation of policy. So to be eligible to apply to STPF, applicants do have to have completed and hold their, their qualifying degree, so a doctoral level STEM degree, or a master's in engineering with three years of professional engineering work experience. Um, applicants do need to hold US citizenship, and they cannot be full-time permanent federal employees, um, and that includes Title 42 positions and PMF uh, fellows, and they cannot be full-time AAAS employees. Now, SDPF has placements in what we call four fellowship areas, and these reflect the three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, judicial, excuse me, and also the Roger Ravel Fellowship and Global Stewardship. So a little about each. Executive branch placements are the most numerous of the four fellowship areas with more than 100 per year. And these are fellows who are contributing to policy, administration, and imp implementation in federal agencies, such as the Agency for International Development, the National Science Foundation, the State Department, Health and Human Services, and NASA, to name a few. And fellows are serving alongside staff and perhaps other PMF fellows in federal agencies. AAAS um, also has and funds two congressional science and engineering fellowship placements every year. And these fellows are working on Capitol Hill to help research, develop, and draft legislation and provide input to policy review and oversight. And in addition, there are about 30 other congressional placements that are available through partner societies like the American Physical Society. These other societies also value the importance of science and decision making um, on Capitol Hill, and they have their own application and selection process to select these congressional fellows. So we'll share more about that later, but just know that if you're interested in congressional placements, you can also apply to partner societies as well as through AAAS. AAAS has one fellow that's placed in the Federal Judicial Center as a judicial branch fellow, and they spend a year contributing scientific and technical expertise to judicial administration, operations, education programs, protocol, discovery, and they're learning firsthand about contemporary policy issues facing the judiciary. And AAAS also has one placement for the Roger Ravel Fellowship. And the Ravel Fellow engages in the public policy arena, um, contributing uh, their, their skills, their expertise, uh, multi multidisciplinary background towards solutions to important societal problems. 
um, applicants who for or excuse me anticipated placement for their Val fellow could be in the federal government or at an environmental or sustainability oriented um, nonprofit organization or other approved organization. And the fellowship is open to applicants uh, with seven years of post-degree professional experience. So the Ravel Fellowship um, is for somebody who is a more mid or senior in their career. Now I share this slide not to be too overwhelming for us all, but to just highlight again those 30 partner societies I mentioned who also fund congressional fellowship placements like APS. So again, if you are interested in congressional fellowships, you can apply to AAAS, our SDPF program, and you can apply to as many of these partner societies as you are able and eligible. And you can even tune in um, for uh, another webinar uh, next week where you can hear from fellows who have been in both STPF and APS Congressional Fellow. Now together, AAAS and our partner societies um, bring together a strong cohort of fellows for more than 47 years. We're nearing our 50th anniversary, and here we have our outgoing class of 2019-2020 fellows. They represent 273 unique experiences supporting science policy. And our incoming class, who's starting next week with their orientation, is 284 strong. And as you can see, a lot has changed in the past 47 years, and we are proud of what our fellowship class represents and the diversity of our fellows. Now, in addition to a full-time position in the federal government, STPF supports fellows through a formal professional development program. We recognize that the fellowship is a year of service and learning. And the professional development kicks off with a two-week orientation in September. This is an intense overview of our federal government and a chance to network and bond with your fellow fellows. Following orientation, STPF offers monthly professional development workshops that focus on four core learning objectives. These are meant to support fellows during and following their fellowship. And in addition, fellows receive training funds, which can be used to work with SDPF approved professional career coaches. Now, if any of this sounds interesting to you, you might be wondering, so what can I do right now to be a strong candidate for this fellowship? I would say continue your hard work on your degree if you're still in graduate school um, or approaching graduate school and excel in your field of study. Publish appropriately for your field and career stage. Um, your scientific and technical background and professional accomplishments are worth 40 of 100 points um, that reviewers can score. And then how to be a well-rounded applicant. Um, you'll also want to you know, demonstrate and work on your leadership skills, problem solving abilities, communication, interpersonal and outreach skills, commitment to the fellowship mission, um, and explore your policy interests. I think Gail said it best from her Zion, and it's also true for STPF, that we're looking for applicants with a demonstrated interest in policy, but we're not expecting a mastery of it. That's what these fellowship experiences are for. And I'd also like to echo um, some of the characteristics that Becca mentioned for PMF. I think that you know flexibility, um, and public service are also values that we share with at STPF. And the application itself includes a series of essays, a five-page CV, um, or maximum of five pages for that CV, and three letters of reference. Now, I just want to share that a science policy path is in many ways very different from the process um, and paths you may have encountered in academia, and it is precisely because of your academic training that allows you to delve into and contribute to the important scientific and technical technological issues that we're facing in the US and around the world. And so we look, like to joke, um, you know, that this fellowship will take you outside of your comfort zone. If you are interested in applying to the fellowship, the application is open now. It opened June 1st and will close on November 1st. And applicants who apply in 2020 will go through a review and interview process into the spring of 2021 and individuals are offered a fellowship um, and that would begin September 1st of 2021 that runs for the full year and concludes August 31st 2022.
And I do just want to hope uh, share my inf contact information. I hope you stay in touch with, with me, with the fellowship program, with everybody who you've met. And I will kind of change my hat really quickly. And I do want to, in addition to talking about STPF, um, segue into thinking about other opportunities beyond these three fellowship programs that we've just shared about. Um, we may know that you might not be eligible or interested yet in these fellowships, but you might be very interested in science policy. And I just wanted to share some of these resources, um, ways you can get involved or get started. And I'm going to run through a lot in a short period of time. And so I'm hoping that um, what you can take away are some specific examples, but also the sense, the breadth of resources that are out there. And I can work with MidHat and the APS team to make sure we get these resources into your hands um, because I know you can't click on the links on my slides. Um, and so with that, I do want to just share that in addition to the three fellowships that we highlighted, there is also the AAAS Mass Media Fellowship. So that's a summer long fellowship and it's more focused on science communication and science journalism. And that puts scientists and engineers into news agencies for the summer where they write and contribute to articles from that scientific lens. And then I know that there are a number of state level fellowships as well. Some well-known ones include the California Science and Technology Policy Fellowships, but there are many other states that have state level fellowship placements. So if you are looking to have impact at the state level or stay in your local community, there are opportunities there. And somebody from the science policy community has put together this list, which is a Google Doc that lists, I think, almost any state level and federal fellowship that I've seen. It's very comprehensive, and so we'll make sure you get this link because you can cross-reference it with your interests and your eligibility. And if we go beyond fellowships, there are many different workshops that focus on science policy. Two of them that AAAS offers um, are the Catalyzing Advocacy in Science and Engineering, or CASE workshop. Um, that happens every spring, and we bring graduate students to Washington, D.C. to come together and almost like a mini orientation for that the fellows undergo for our fellowship. So if you're interested in learning more about science policy and you're in graduate school, um, CASE is one opportunity. And another opportunity is um, a policy forum that AAAS puts on every year. It'll be happening this October. It's two days, it's virtual, and it's free. And so this is something you could sign up for right away and join and hear some pretty engaging, dynamic science policy speakers. And then a few other things that came to mind included um, the National Science Policy Network's resource guide, which is very comprehensive. It's excellent. Um, and then the Sci on the Fly blog and podcast that SDPF fellows run. And uh, something that I'm missing here, but did want to give shout outs to include um, a couple of networks that you can join. So one is the National Science Policy Network listed here. Another is ESEP, uh, Eng Engaging Scientists and Engineers in Policy. And then the last one is ESAL, Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally. So those are ways at the state, uh, local or federal level that you can get plugged into resources, uh, other fellowships or other science policy networks. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Minat who can share a few more additional ways to get involved with science policy. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you to all of our speakers for all the uh, detailed information on the application process and um, requirements for each of these programs. Um, in addition to what Jessica mentioned, um, I want to, um, Jessica did talk about the APS and AIP Congressional Fellowships, um, and since I um, am representing APS on the call. I do want to give a few more details here. So both APS and AIP also offer congressional fellowships in partnership uh, with the AAAS STPF program. Um, this is a one-year program where fellows work with the congressional office or committee. So if you're more interested on, in the legislative branch rather than the executive branch, 
um, you can apply for this fellowship. The requirements are, of course, you should have a strong interest in science and technology policy. Um, you should have some experience in applying scientific knowledge to solve societal problems. Um, a PhD is not required at the time of application, um, but it is required prior to the start of the fellowship, which is um, in the September of the following year. So if you are someone who is in a graduate program right now, um, you won't be graduating until next year, you are still eligible to apply for the congressional fellowships. Um, U.S. citizenship is required for the APS fellowship, um, and legal authorization to work in the U.S. is required for the AIP one. Um, and then, of course, you should be an APS member or an AIP or partner society member to apply to these fellowships. Uh, to apply, you will need a letter of intent, a resume, and three letters of references. So applications are due by December 15th. Um, you can find more information on the program um, at the link below. Um, but yeah, since December is not that far off and it's always good to start early, um, so start thinking about what you would want to put in the letter of intent, what, who you would ask for references. Um, it's always good to prepare early. Um, so that's the APS AIP Congressional Fellowship. Um, I also want to mention, um, so Jessica talked about a few avenues of staying informed for um, getting involved in advocacy work. Um, there are a few more avenues that I want to talk about. So you can sign up for APS's Signal Boost to get the latest news on science policy, perspectives, and pathways for action every month. You can go to go.aps.org slash signal boost 2020. Um, and once you sign up, you'll receive uh, emails every month that will tell you the latest news and you can stay you can stay informed that way. You can also visit the APS Action Center to learn about the issues that APS works on. So our Office of Government Affairs um, does a lot of advocacy work on issues that impact our members. So one of the things we're working on right now are visas and immigration. So if you want to learn about any of the issues that we're working on, you can follow this link um, and not only can you learn about the issues, but there's also action items, so actions that you can take to get um, involved in advocacy today um, on issues that you care about. Lastly, to stay up to date on science-related budgets, bills, and leadership changes, you can subscribe to AIP's FYI. Um, so this is more of a, um, it's a more frequent bulletin that um, sends updates related to any changes that are happening or any new bills that are coming up. Um, so I highly recommend doing that as well. Um, okay, before I talk about the upcoming broadcasts, um, we're going to move into the Q&A. So, um, at this time, I will ask uh, our speakers to um, unmute as you see fit um, as I'm asking these questions. Um, thank you again all for being here, and we are getting a lot of questions, so I will do my best to um, go through those. So, um, one of a lot of the questions coming in are related to international folks. So I'm going to try to capture them as one. So uh, the first question is, hi, thank you for the great webinar. I was wondering whether, um, sorry, wrong question. Uh, what type of jobs, if any, are available for international students in science policy? Are all government jobs that require, do all government jobs require citizenship or permanent residency? Um, and another related question is, are postdocs holding an H-1B visa eligible? So um, I invite our speakers now to answer these questions. I, I can answer the question about the H-1B visas. So um, yes, uh, fellows holding an H-1B visa, it depends on whether or not it's employer if your employer is if it's linked to employment with a particular employ, employer then your employer would have to allow a leave of absence but we don't have yeah you know, the resign fellowship program doesn't have a problem with that um i have a visa officer who goes through and makes sure that you're eligible to receive a stipend um, for the resign program and then because we probably have the most international students coming through we, because we allow and encourage international students. I would say, you know, our, a lot of our fellows, the, you know, we try to um, help them network with um, people at the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, um, and some of the other international organizations um, that are in DC um, who are interested in science policy. 
a lot of them do go back to our home country, their home countries um, after they they finish their studies here in the United States. Some of them um, from the 2019 class. I have a fellow who, um, an electrical engineering fellow from Lebanon, who is working in Fort Worth at a startup, um, who got you know um, I think she's on her OPT, the optional practical training for those of you who don't know. Thank you. Um, did anyone else want to add to that? This is Jessica with the AAAS s and Policy Fellowships. I can just, yeah, um, confirm that U.S. citizenship is one of the requirements for applicants. Um, that can be dual citizenship from the U.S. and another country. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, H-1B visa holders wouldn't be eligible for us, but I would just encourage them to look at those congressional fellowship placements through our partners because every partner is different and not all require U.S. citizenship. Right, um, so there's actually a follow-up question for you, Jessica, about other opportunities in AAAS um, that are for non-U.S. citizens who have been educated in the U.S. That is a great question. I cannot speak to the specific eligibilities off the top of my head for the mass media fellowship and the case workshop. That's something that I can share with you, Midhat, to make sure we get out to the group um, after the fact. But AAAS membership, attendance at our conferences, attendance with, at our science and technology policy forum, all of those things are, are open to everyone worldwide. Awesome, thank you, Jessica. Um, okay, next question. I was wondering whether Christine Rosaya and PMF fellowships will accept postdocs who have obtained their PhD more than three years ago. Uh, from Rosain, uh, if, if you are currently a postdoc, um, yes, if you're in, if you graduated four years ago or even five years ago, we will accept applicants. Um, I will say, you know, you have to be very careful when you're thinking about applying. Um, most of our fellows are either graduate students or, or recent PhDs and are willing to live on our very, our not very generous stipends. Um, so uh, I just keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. And Rebecca, did you want to add to that? Uh, you're muted if you are trying. Uh, Hi, this is Becca with PMF. I just wanted to, to confirm that PMF regulations are very strict regarding um, when you graduate. So unfortunately, someone who's obtained their PhD more than three years ago would not be eligible. Um, and just a follow up question um, for the PMF fellowship. It's um, I think I know the answer, but just to just to clarify, is it available to Canadians with TN status? Um, this does not require work sponsorship, but is a non immigration visa that provides legal status to work in the US. So for PMF, it's a little bit tricky. You should definitely apply. Um, however, your your options might be limited as a finalist, depending on what each agency's rules and regulations are. Because we work with so many different agencies, it's really gonna be up to um, whether an agency has the ability to bring you on under um, that type of um, status. So just checking in with the, you know, a specific agency when you're doing your interviews is the best way to go about doing it. But I'd say apply and then we can try to see what, what we can make work. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, next question. Does PMF have any opportunities for postdocs with more than two years away from their PhD date? Unfortunately, no. Um, we, we see ourselves as 
more of like an entry level into the federal government. And so we fall under the pathways regulations, um, which is focused on current and recent grads. So unfortunately, that is beyond our, our timeline for recent grads. And so leading into the next question, are there any programs geared to late career or even retired scientists, either in Washington, D.C. or elsewhere? Um, this is Jessica with STPF. I'm jumping on this one if it's all right, because um, the STPF program welcomes fellows of all career stages. So there is not any career limit or age limit on who can be fellows. And we have fellows who use us as a transition point in their career, as a sabbatical, if they're a faculty member, um, we have fellows who have neared or been in retirement and then come and spend the year as a fellow. So. Feel free to send me a note if you would like to talk more or connect to somebody who's done the fellowship later in their career. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and we have um, another question for you. Uh, how many people apply to the AAAS fellowship each year, if you are willing to share? So we unfortunately don't share our application stats every year, but I can share that um, we find that about a quarter to a third of our applicants get placed as fellows every year. But again, as I was reviewing the different placement areas, the executive, legislative, judicial, Ravel, and the number of placements that we offer in each, um, I think you can tell that there are, you know, certain branches are going to have certain acceptance rates just because of the limited number or number of positions in each. Thank you. Um, Let's see. Uh, again, you don't have to answer this, uh, Becca, but um, what is the average salary for PMF fellows? So you can go on to our to the GSA website and look up or just Google GS pay scale. The reason I can't give you a clear answer is because the pay scale is dependent on where um, you're located. So it's based on um, locality. But I will say for the DC area, um, you could start as high as about $72,000 at a GS-11 and end your two years at um, over $102,000 at a GS-13. So hopefully that gives you a sense of it. But yeah, you can go ahead and just look up GS-9, 11, and 12 on the pay scale and that will help guide you a little bit more. Thank you. Um, and then we have this, this is a really great question. Um, where did it go? Um, so the question in uh, general is about, um, so someone who is in a doctoral program, aside from what you've shared, are there any other things I should keep in mind when preparing to apply? Are there academic experiences, networking I can do in the meantime? This is Jessica with STPF. Um, I'm, I know I'm just repeating myself, but I would say the answer is yes. So I think that there is absolutely um, steps you can take to explore your interests in policy. Right? Like There is a reason why you joined us here today. There are things you are interested in and passionate about and they absolutely deserve your time and attention. And so it might be connecting with a national network or a local network. It may be connecting with a science policy group on campus or helping to form one. Um, it might be attending events or classes um, or um, fellows do any number of things ahead of being coming a fellow. And I'm sure this is the same for PMF and Resyan, but um, there's not one right way to explore science policy, but it's um, there are definitely the right ways that are authentic to you. I agree, um, Mrs. Gale. Um, that was really well put. I, I, you know, what I will say, what people are looking for the most, I think, in an application for Mersine is how what you're studying, how it's encouraged you to be interested in science and technology policy. And, you know, that there are a variety of different ways that that can happen. And to demonstrate that, you know, like, you know, just exploring what is out there, either at the state level, at the local level, even at the federal level, um, and showing that you're interested um, 
you know, the program was was put in place because there is a recognition that academia, you know, does a great job of teaching you how to be a researcher and doesn't provide any kind of background and how to, you know, move into this kind of science and technology career. Great. Thank you for that. Um, that all of those answers are very helpful. Um, I'm going to quickly take this one. Does APF, APS membership make you an AIP member? Um, so AI, uh, APS is a member society, an affiliated society of AIP. So having an APS membership, um, you can apply to both the APS and the AIP congressional fellowships. Um, in fact, you can actually um, just use the same portal and you can only apply to the APS Congressional Fellowship and at the end you can click to send your um, application to both APS and AIP using the same application. Um, thank you for that question. And um, I do apologize that my, my slides were not visible earlier, so I've put them up. Um, here are the details for the APS and the AIP Congressional Fellowship. I went over these earlier, um, but I'll leave these up so you can see um, um, the link and also the information if you missed it earlier. Um, okay, there was another really great question. Uh, both the Merzaya Fellowship and the AAAS STPF applications include strong writing components. Are there general styles, resources, or skills that are recommended for scientists to learn for these writing samples? Um, I can answer from Merzaya. Um, so, no, I don't, I, you know, it's got to be true to you. Um, I would say, um, uh, you know, making sure that it's coherent, it's well written, that's what's going to grab somebody's attention, um, you know, of how you can express yourself. Because that's a huge component is um, showing that your um, verbal communication skills are good. And this is Jessica for the STPF fellowship. I think it's similar in that it's really up to each applicant to determine what they're sharing in their essays, statements, in the letters of recommendation, and thinking of it as this, yes, a cohesive package that somebody's looking at and being able to have all of that information to evaluate you um, in written form. And then if you are invited further along to a virtual interview as a semifinalist, then there's also, you know, the oral presentation and how you present orally to a group. Um, and then there is a, as part of that semifinal stage, a one page policy memo writing exercise. But um, part of that exercise is understanding how the applicants go about preparing themselves. And so Googling, connecting with uh, science policy resources on campus or in your community or connecting with fellows or alumni are all great resources. Thank you, Jessica. Um, okay, next question. Is there a cap on how many times we can apply to the fellowship? Uh, I'll answer for Marzahn quickly. There is no cap on, on applying. Um, in fact, there are only, um, our the Merzion Fellowship is capped at 26, and usually our cohort is between 23 and 26. And so very few, um, you know, that's that's small. And so, you know, many of our fellows didn't make it the first time and reapplied. Um, it's a combination of what, you know, what projects are going on at the National Academy, so what kind of backgrounds people are looking for. Um, so some of this is just kind of a random when you, you know, there's some randomness associated with it. There's no um, penalty to reapplying as long as you're, you know, close to, you're in the right kind of age frame. And for the STPF fellowship, there is no cap on the number of times you apply. And we have found that Folks who reapply um, have been successful that second or even a third time around, especially if you've gotten through the, the written application to, say, a semifinalist interview or a finalist stage. 
um, and you're not you don't become a fellow at that point you've had more perspective and insights into the review process and the interview process and that might help an applicant be successful uh, in a future iteration and finally for pms um you're eligible to apply three times based on one advanced degree if you end up going back to school and getting another degree you can always apply again but it's just based on our eligibility criteria awesome thank you all for answering that question and then i quickly have um two quick questions for jessica and then we'll close things up um, are deferrals are allowed for AAAS STPF? So if I'm admitted to the program and I want to delay it a year, is that okay? Um, and the next question is, what percentage of fellows stay within science policy following each fellowship? Yes, so the for the first question, no, deferrals are not allowed. So somebody would have to reapply if they declined um, or withdrew at any point in the application or interview process. And then for the second question, um, could you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Uh, so in, in your experience, what percentage of fellows um, stay on and um, continue in science policy versus uh, going into academia or industry or somewhere else? Thank you. I, we find that about, about half of fellows when they're leaving and we survey them at the end of their fellowship, about half stay in science policy. That could be finding a full-time position in the federal government or at their placement office, but it may be working in another sector that's policy adjacent. Um, and then about a quarter go back into academia and a quarter go into industry. But we at AAAS are agnostic as to kind of where they take all their experiences and their expertise um, after the fellowship. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica, Dr. Cohen, and Becca. I really appreciate uh, your time today. Um, before we wrap up, I do want to to um, show again this slide for how to get involved in science policy, please visit um, APS.org slash policy um, to access these resources and get involved in advocacy. Um, and then I also want to mention that next week we'll have part two of this series. So we'll have a career panel and virtual networking event. So today we learned all about what kinds of options are available to you in policy. Um, next week we're going to talk to four panelists who will discuss their career paths in science policy. And after the panel, we'll even um, have um, some networking time available. So you can choose to go and network with each of the panelists in a virtual Zoom room. So if you are interested, please register um, at the link provided. Um, I also want to mention that this, this next event will wrap up our summer webinar series. Thank you all so much um, for staying with us throughout the summer. I hope you enjoyed the series and learned a lot. Um, we will continue holding webinar series, um, but you will have to sign up for these separately. One of the topics we are planning on launching in mid-September is success in industry. Um, so these webinars will focus on how to prepare for successful careers in the private sector. Um, so to sign up for future webinars on this topic or on other topics, please go to info.aps.org slash careers slash webinars, um, and you can sign up to receive emails about um, all the new webinar series that we're launching. Um, all right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, all our speakers. This is all the time we have today for the official webinar. We apologize if we did not get to your questions. We encourage you to follow up by sending an email to webinars at APS.org, and we will forward your questions to our speaker for comment. A recording of the video will be emailed to you within five business days, and, we will all, and it will also be posted on our summer webinar homepage. Lastly, in order to help APS continue to develop quality webinar presentations, please help us by taking a moment to complete the short survey as you exit the webinar today. This wraps up today's event. We hope you'll join us again next time. American Physical Society, copyright 2020, all rights reserved.